Um, now, if you remember, the last time I was here, which seems ages ago, we were, we were talking in the Acts of the Apostles, and uh, I guess sometimes we think how wonderful it would have been for us to live in the time of the, of the Acts, you know? I mean, it was a time of miracles, there were earthquakes happening, there was healings, there was uh, great preachings, there was mass conversions. Uh, but then uh, when you think more deeply about that, you think maybe it wasn't so good to live in those times because along with those great wonders, there also came great persecutions of the Christians. Uh, Christians lost their jobs, uh, they lost their homes, sometimes they even lost their lives. Uh, the authorities didn't just crucify Christ, but they also went after their followers. Uh, they did this uh, because they were desperate to shut the disciples up. They saw the, the, the message, the message of Christianity, the gospel, they saw it as a threat to their, their power. Uh, but no matter how hard they tried, they couldn't shut the message down. And I think the reason for that is because the message was so good. Uh, I mean, it talks about pardon for sin. It talks about resurrection from the dead. It talks about eternal life to come. And they simply couldn't stop believe, people believing that great message. It was as if uh, a heavenly hosepipe had been switched on and the uh, powers that be tried to stop the water coming out the pipe by putting a thumb over it. And of course, you know what happens when that happens. Uh, the water sprays all over the place. And that was what was happening as the, as the authorities persecuted the Christians. So the message started to spray out all over the world. Now, uh, today, in the passage that we're talking about today, uh, we, have, uh, we see the mission of these disciples going out. We see the gospel spreading out throughout the whole Roman world at that time. And of course, we are the benefactors of that. Because it went out into the world, we today are hearing the message as well. They couldn't be shut down. Now, our mission, of course, is to continue pouring out that message of the gospel into the world. And we should expect that the world will continue to try to block the hose pipe. Now, in the West, now, it seems like uh, we've got the flow of the gospel down to a, a trickle, as it were. Uh, but I found that uh, immigrants who come to the West, and then, of course, in other parts of the world, the gospel is still flowing out and thousands upon thousands of people are being saved, just like in Acts here. Uh, I was reading that in the global north uh, where we're living, uh, this is one of the statistics, it says that there are 838 million Christians in the global north. Now, I'm not talking about evangelical Christians. I'm just talking about people who would claim to be Christians, the Christian religion, okay? 838 million but in Africa and Asia alone, the same statistic said that there are almost now 1.1 billion Christians in the world. It said that in 1900, one person in 10 knew a Christian. But now in 2022, three persons, three people in 10 know a Christian. And it's estimated that by 2050, one person in five will know a Christian. So I guess what I'm saying about this is don't be discouraged. You know, sometimes we get discouraged because not many people in the West are kind of coming to the Lord. But we shouldn't be discouraged because the gospel is still flowing out into the world and it's still giving hope to all who will wash in its message, right? And I think uh, with the internet, it's going to be more and more difficult for governments to shut down the gospel they'll not be able to keep it from going out and stop people from hearing it. Now, if you remember in Acts, we, we saw the last time when I was here uh, that Peter and John uh, healed the man at the beautiful gate, and then they were arrested uh, for preaching the resurrection in Jesus' name. Uh, the authorities commanded them not to speak in that name, and the disciple asked them a, disciples asked them a great question. He said, who should we obey? Should we obey you or should we obey God? And that's an interesting question, isn't it, that we all have to consider as Christians. Well, now in verse 23, we find that Peter and John are released 
uh, and they go back to uh, the other believers. And uh, so I thought it would be instructive for us to see today uh, what the believers did next when they, when they returned from that experience. And I think it'll, uh, it'll help us understand how we, uh, as Christians and as a church, can be more effective for the Lord. So let's, uh, let's just play again as we begin our message today. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, you are the sovereign Lord who has made all things and who has given us all life. Your Holy Spirit has spoken through your prophets and your apostles and told us to proclaim the good news of pardon for sin through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that the world doesn't like this exclusive message and often reacts violently against it. So please, we ask that you would grant us boldness to declare it with power, with the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. All right then, so to be an effective church, I thought we need to have trust, we need to have expectation, we need to, have, we need to be seeking, and we need to be receiving. So let's first of all talk about trust. That's the first thing that we need. We need to trust as a church in the sovereignty of God. And this is verses 23 and 24. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Now, that, that uh, phrase, the sovereign Lord, is actually one Greek word. And it's an interesting word because we still have it in English today. And it's the word, you won't like this, but it's the word despot. Despot, okay? And it was actually used in those days for slave owners. Uh, and it was used to them because they had the power of life and death over their slaves. And so when it, it's used of God, and I think this is the only time it's actually used of God, but when it's used of God, uh, what it means is that he is the controller of all things, and he is the controller of everyone, including the rulers of this world. Okay? Now this is the God that the disciples, when they begin to pray, when, they, when, they, when Peter and John return, this is the God that the disciples are praying to. He's not a democratically elected prime minister or, pre or president. He's an absolute ruler who created all things and sustains all things. Without him, we would be nothing and we, we could do nothing. Everything and everyone depends upon him. And that's what the idea of sovereignty actually means in this context. Now, this, of course, should encourage us because this is why we can pray and we can ask the Lord's blessing on our lives and indeed on everything that we can do. And this is why those who rebel against this great God are in a very dangerous position. So let's try and illustrate this. Uh, suppose you wanted to go scuba diving, although I'm sure that not many of us would want to do that, but suppose you wanted to go scuba diving and you, you go into the water and your air is supplied by a tube that runs up to the boat above. Now you are free to swim under the sea, but your life depends upon the captain of the boat above you. He keeps the air flowing to you. So he, in this context, is a despot, okay? He's a despot, for he has the power of life and death over you. Now knowing this, you make sure that you do all that you can to keep the captain happy, okay? You're in such a vulnerable position that you won't dare offend him. You will be foolish to rebel against him and take a hammer and chisel and try to knock a hole in the bottom of the boat. Nor will you uh, cut the air tube that he's supplying the air to you uh, from. This is our position in the world in which we're living. Our lives, whether we believe it or not, our lives depend upon the Lord above us. He provides the life that we need. But the good thing is this, and this is what, we, this is what the understanding we get about this God from the Bible. The good thing is this, this, is that the Lord is a kind and gracious Lord, okay? He is a kind master, a kind captain. So instead of cutting the air off to us when 
humanity rejected him and sinned against him, what he did, we know the story, don't we? He bore with that rebellion, inviting the people to repent and trust in him. And this is what we've done when we become Christians. We were once rebels against this sovereign Lord. Uh, we sinned against him. But by his grace, Christ came to call us to salvation. We heard that message. We repented of our sin and our rebellion. And now we try to live by following the directions that our captain gives to us in his word. Now, the disciples know that this is the Lord who is in control of the circumstances that they're experiencing at this time. And they know this because just like us, they know the scriptures. And that's why they quote the scriptures here. They quote David in Psalm 2. But they declare that David's words are the words of God given by the Holy Spirit, which confirms to us that the Holy Spirit is God and also that the Bible is God's word. We learn from this that we Christians must live upon the truths of God that are found in the Bible. They, the disciples, depended upon their word, those words for their understanding of what God was doing. We have to do the same. This is why we, we call the Bible a spiritual food, right? It's what sustains us. And, and, and this is what is happening here. Uh, this is what makes us believers, right? Because we're trusting in God as he is revealed in the scriptures. They tell us, these scriptures, tell us what's going on in this earth. And they also tell us, to a certain extent, what's going on in the mind of God in heaven as well. You see, behind this material world in which we're living, uh, we understand from the scriptures that a plan is in progress. But of course, a plan is not physical, right? It's not material, it's spiritual. So we can't see it, but except what the scripture tells us about it. And also, as we look back in hindsight, we can see the effects of that plan in history. So what's happening in history, what happened here, uh, what's happening today, isn't really happening by chance, although we might think it is. It's not. All events are moving to a purposeful end. And that's why he's talking there about the, the predestination of God. So what the disciples are going through here is expected. It was foretold. And this is what makes them trust in the sovereign law. Now, as a church, as a church, we also need to trust in the same Lord. He is fulfilling his purpose for us in our lives. So let's keep on trusting in the captain above us, as it were, and uh, let's keep cooperating with the plan that he has revealed to us in the Old Testament and which is fulfilled in the New Testament. Uh, let's not worry about the events that are going on around us, the political upheavals that are going on around us, but rather let's pray to the one who controls those events. You see, if God created all things, as the Bible tells us, then surely he can change all things. So even when men do great evil, God is able to take that evil and twist it and force good out of it. Again, uh, think about Joseph in the Old Testament and the great evil that his brothers did against him. Uh, the Lord took the evil and he twisted it and he forced it to produce good. Using the evil, he saved them. Can you believe it? He saved them and uh, all from famine, saved them all from famine. And because they were saved, the Messiah came through them and the Lord changed the world for good. And of course, we've been impacted by that because we've heard about this Messiah and we've trusted in him. So what I'm saying is that the rebellion of people cannot thwart God's plan. So this is why we should trust in him, okay? He's going to fulfill that plan. And this, of course, is why we should pray to him as well, because he is in charge. So that's the first point. We've got to be a trusting church. Secondly, to be an effective church, we've got to have expectation. And what we should expect is the opposition of the world. And this is the next section. 
at verse 25 to 28. Who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the Lord's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan are predestined to take place. Okay, <clears throat> now when I say that uh, we should expect the opposition of the world, when I use the word world, what I mean is the world system, uh, the age in which we're living, the rebellious spirit that pervades all things. Now, it, this world system, as it were, is in opposition to the sovereignty of God and his system, okay? Or his kingdom, if you like. That's what we sometimes use that term, right? The, the kingdom of the world is the kingdom of God, right? Well, these two kingdoms are in opposition. Now, the rules of the world, this world, are under the control of this worldly spirit. And they uh, resist and refuse to be reconciled to God. They prefer to be their own despots, okay? Uh, they're not, not realizing, of course, that the real tyrant is actually sin and evil itself. Uh, sin and evil manipulates the rulers of this world, and eventually it will destroy them. Now, we see this in the quotation that Peter uses in, in Psalm 2. This psalm was written 900 years before these events, but it foretell, foretells to us how the leaders will respond to the Messiah. They will rage. They will plot in vain. Uh, they will gather together against him and his anointed. But as the old saying goes, when men plan, God laughs. And that's what it says in Psalm 2. It says, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Uh, the rulers are unable to stop God fulfilling his plan in providing salvation to the world. We also learn that the wickedness that, that they are uh, guilty of here in, in, in murdering the Messiah and also persecuting the Christians is all under God's control. So think about it like this. Think of a steam engine. Uh, now the steam in the engine becomes wickedly hot, right? But because the engineer knows what he's doing, he's able to harness that scalding, burning, raging steam and he uses it to make the train go, move forward to its destination. Well, so it is with the leader's rage here against Christ and against his people. What God does, he harnesses that scalding hatred of Herod, of Pilate, of the Gentiles, and of the leaders of the people, and he uses it to provide an atoning sacrifice to save the world and also to save them if they are willing to trust in him. So if you get a chance when you go home, I would encourage you to read Psalm 2. Uh, it talks about the rebellion of the leaders, and it talks about the destruction that they will, they, they, they will experience. But it also says before it ends, something very, very beautiful. It says this, it says, kiss the son and take refuge in him. Now that, so that's, that's an offer to these wicked authorities that they too can be saved if they will turn back to God. And that's what we've done, right? We've done this when we turned and believed in the Lord. Uh, thank the Lord, he saved us, and he will save all who rebel against him. If they will kiss the Son, if they will be reconciled to him, that's the idea here, if they will trust in him. So now, because we are now on the side of the Son, uh, uh, the world system naturally will oppose us too. You see, the Lord, when he saved us, has kind of turned us around. So now that we're going in the opposite direction from what we were before. And you can think of, a, of it like an escalator. If an escalator is going down and you're going down with it, there's not a problem. But if you turn around on that escalator and try to go up, then you're going to run into trouble because now you are going against the flow and you're going to upset everyone coming down. Now, this is why Jesus got into trouble. He, he didn't 
go with everyone else. He didn't go the way that the leaders wanted him to go, and he got into trouble for it. And this is why the disciples here are in trouble. They're out of step. Uh, they're not going the way that the society and the politicians want them to go. They're preaching this gospel message, and, it, and they don't like it. It ruffles their feathers because it's an exclusive message, and it's upsetting the powerful people. And, of course, that's making the disciples get into trouble. Now, as a church, we mustn't go with the flow. We've been turned around by the Lord when we trusted in him, and now we are going against the flow. Not because we want to. We don't want to. We want to live at peace with all men. But we are going against the flow because the world is flowing in the wrong direction. We go against the flow when we present Christ and him risen from the dead as the only solution to human sin. You see, we're not just up here to preach, you know, bad, 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 sin, sin, sin. That's not our message. Our message is to preach Christ as the way to escape from the bad, as the way to escape from the sin. We resist the world by offering people a better world to live in hereafter for sure, but also right now in the kingdom of God. We can live in the kingdom of God right now while we're here on earth in relationship with God, in opposition to live uh, in his kingdom. And this, of course, isn't a popular message because people tend to love this world system. So in order for them to, to join the kingdom of God, they've got to turn. And only God, of course, can, can have that impact upon their lives as they hear and, and experience the gospel. So what I'm saying, I guess, is that as a church, we, we should expect opposition from the world. But we should also expect that the Lord is going to twist their opposition and use it to introduce something good and probably introduce more people to the sun. We see this often where in countries where the gospel is, is uh, perhaps on the ground. That it's odd, but well, usually many more people trust the Lord when it's when it's uh, being when when the people of God are being persecuted than they do in the West, where the message is allowed to go free. Persecution, as I say, tends to spray the message out. Thirdly, to be an effective church, we need boldness, boldness, and we must seek boldness from God to preach the gospel. And again, this is verses 29 and 30. <clears throat> And now, Lord, look upon the threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So, okay, so the disciples, knowing that this sovereign Lord is in control, they want to be part of his plan. But they have a problem. The authorities have commanded them not to preach in the name of Jesus or to teach about the resurrection from the dead. And they're threatening them. And of course, this is scary, right? These are powerful people. So it's going to take courage for them to obey God and to disobey the government. But where do they get this courage from? Well, we see here, they get this courage from God. That's why they're praying for it. And indeed, that's why they're quoting the Bible, right? Because they, 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 they're looking to God and his plan and saying, Lord, we need the courage to, put this, to, to be part of this plan. The amazing thing is how many times as you read the Bible, uh, God actually tells his people to have courage and not be afraid. It's constantly repeated for us. And that's where we get our courage from. We get our courage from listening to the uh, promises of God. When he tells us, look, you've, you've no need to be afraid. I am with you. It's those promises as we believe them, right, faith, as we believe them that will make us brave and that will make us able to preach the gospel that the world so desperately needs. Martin Luther, he believed this, and he was able to defy the authorities of the day. He argued, he argued like this, this kind of surprised me, but he argued that he would obey the government officials of his day even though they didn't love God, he said he would obey them as long as they didn't shut up the word of God. You know, it's a great principle for us to keep in mind. So we obey the government when, we, when they give us lawful commands, for sure. We're going to be good citizens. 
But if they order us to stop preaching the gospel, that's when we must put our foot down and we must refuse. We want to be part of the plan of God, not part of their plan. And in fact, during this COVID uh, shutdown, uh, the government were able to close the churches, right? But one thing they didn't do, and this was good, they didn't shut down the message because of the internet. That's why I mentioned the internet before. It was the internet that made the difference here. Uh, Because on the internet, all the churches were were forced to get, 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 get with the audio video uh, uh, craze and they were they all went online and so the actual fact the gospel was was preached even more than it was before and even me who, who's a complete clocks when it comes to this stuff i went online too and i found that i was able to preach to more people online than they ever did in the church in fact i'm still doing it i'm still trying to get the message out because i know it's the message That is the power. It's the message that God is going to use to turn people back to him. So that's the important thing. Whatever happens, just like these guys, we've got to get this message out. This is how we're going to help people. And this is the approach of Peter and John, the message of Christ crucified, raised from the dead in order to blot out a sin is everything. They likely expected, I'm sure, even when they went out to preach again, that they would be imprisoned. They, they may have even feared that they would be crucified, but they still continue to preach. And we know from the text that thousands upon thousands of more people were saved and the hope of eternal life continued to spread out into the whole Roman world. Now, this is often the way that the Lord works. Um, uh, you know, if you read history and you, you read some of the experiences of the way the gospel has been preached. One story that I read was a pastor in Spain uh, many years ago, uh, uh, many, many years ago. But his name, a really cool name, he, he was called the Reverend Mr. Martini. Martini, isn't that a cool name? But anyway, he, at that time in Spain, it was illegal for a Protestant to preach to more than 20 people at one time. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? We still have that today in some parts of the world. Well, what happened one day, he's preaching to his 20 people, and 250 people gather together outside, of his, outside the meeting place. And uh, so now he's got a problem. What's he going to do? None of them can get in. Is he going to obey God, or is he going to obey man? Well, Mr. Martini decided that this was from God, and so he went outside and he preached. And he was arrested, and he was sent to prison for 46 days. They were really tough in those days. Well, in the prison, he was well treated. And in fact, the mayor and many of the important officials of the city uh, actually came to visit with him. And he was able to hand them gospel tracts. And not only that, but, but there was 50 other prisoners in the jail with him. And so he was able to preach to them. So he could do inside the prison what he couldn't do outside the prison. So again, God twisted it. Uh, a bad situation, and he brought good out of it. Now, this is, po- is important for us, for what we see here. When bad happens, it seems to us that God has left us, but in fact, that's most likely when God is working in our lives. And again, I told you about my, my son's pastor. He was involved in a gang shooting and ended up in prison here in Toronto for 12 years. Uh, but there, in the gospel, he heard the gospel, and he were in, in the prison, he heard the gospel and was saved. And now he's planting a church in Toronto with my son. And uh, so again, there it is. God's twisting the bad that happened and making good happen from it. So as a church, we need courage to preach the gospel and we need to pray for it. Interestingly enough, the disciples don't ask God to change the attitudes of the authority. You know, if I'd have been praying at that time, I, I'd have probably said, oh, Please, Lord, uh, don't make the authorities friendlier. You know, make them more positive towards the gospel. This, they didn't pray like that. They prayed that they would have the courage to defy the authorities and do what God actually wanted. So pray for our church that we'll be bold in preaching the gospel. And then lastly, to be an effective church, we need to receive. And by that, I mean we need to re- receive the Holy Spirit. This is uh, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So the disciples prayed. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. The building shakes, and uh, this, is, I guess, is how they knew that they were filled at that time. But I'm happy to tell you 
that when we pray for the filling of the Holy Spirit, the building won't shake anymore. At least I, I hope not, right? At the time of Acts, as it mentioned there, was a time of great wonders. And God uh, gave great confirmations to assure the disciples and the apostles, look, I'm with you. Uh, get busy. And the signs were, were given to help them be courageous in getting the message out. And uh, God uh, shook the building, as it were, so that they wouldn't shake. They would have the courage to go out and do it. Now, again, we don't expect the buildings to shake today, but we should still should expect to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we will know that we are filled with the Spirit by the effect he has upon our lives. This is why we talk, we talk about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. This is the sign today of the Spirit's filling. But we'll also know it by boldly proclaiming the gospel to those who need to hear it even if the authorities are threatening us. And thank God, you know, they're not doing that at this time. So if our church is filled with the Spirit, then the good news is that Christ will flow out of us and the gospel will flow out of us as well. So as we, as we finish here, I was wondering how to illustrate this. And one thing I've been doing with my grandchildren, we got a pass for the zoo. And so we've been going to the zoo quite regularly. The children love it. It's a great, it's a great day out. But anyway, it made me think about the zoo. And, and, and suppose... In the zoo, there's a handler, and he loves the tiger. But of course, the tiger is a tiger, and he has no love for the handler. But then there's a fire in the tiger enclosure, and the tiger is trapped, and he's terrified. The handler goes in and shows the tiger the way out, but as the tiger is running past the man, he, he swipes at the tiger, at the handler, and he kills him. Now... If that saved tiger could think, he might think to himself, you know, I owe my life to that handler, and I truly, truly regret killing him. Well, that's what's going on here. The Lord is the handler. Humanity is the tiger. The Lord loves the people. The people care nothing for the handler. The world is on fire, and the Lord comes to save the people. Well, the people kill him, and God uses his death to open their hearts. They regret their actions, they repent, and they turn to the Lord for pardon. And now we, former rebels, become the Lord's messengers, helping other rebels to call upon the name of the Lord who are willing, who is willing to save each one of them.